My first question, Gopal, is about the what you say the failure of corporate governance is because behavioral factors are bypassed and the emphasis is mostly on process and laws alone. In fact, you have put it very well that you say that niyam is what is being emphasized rather than niti and niyat. Would you like to elaborate that a little bit? So, um it's fashionable nowadays, and I have fallen to that fashion, to quote some old Sanskrit thing, to add uh, weight to the particular argument that you're giving. And uh, I've chosen this 3N formula. After writing the book, I've added a fourth N. So I'll give you the full thing. Um, all of corporate governance is about Niyam. For those who are not following Sanskrit, there are one or two foreign faces, Niyama rules and procedures, okay? But the Niyat, that is the strategic intent or corporate purpose of the person is also of very great relevance. If I am an entrepreneur, a startup founder, and I say within five years, I want to raise a valuation to five billion, become a unicorn or a sunicorn or whatever corny stuff uh, uh, people try to get to, and I'm going to back out by selling X percent of my equity and buy a new house in Koramangala. Sorry, <laughs> Koramangala is incidental, don't get me wrong. <laughs> For those who are from Koramangala, no, no offense man. <clears throat> then I do my run my company in a particular way. If I'm a Godridge or a Tata or a William S. Lever, I say I want to run a company, it will be there after 200 years. What do I have to do to fix it now? There are tiger mothers who raise their daughters or sons, they must get into Harvard somehow or the other. And they put them into the right schools. Nothing wrong with one or the other. I'm just saying you must know the niyat. The other moms who say, let the child grow up naturally. Of course, you must get her to get good marks and so on and so forth. If not Harvard, it's okay. MIT will also do. <laughs> you know, it depends on what sort of view you take on it. <clears throat> and therefore, that is niyat. Uh, niyam or rules. Niti is conduct. How do you behave day to day? And if I once, uh, I'm taking a rather dramatic example, but in the interest of time, I'm taking it. I don't want to make a generalization out of it. I was once invited to a debate in Calcutta, which is my home city. I was born and raised there. And the subject was something like professional managers, entrepreneurship, some such thing. And the guy on the other side, made the following statement. I am chairman of so-and-so company. It is my family company. And I'm running this company because I know that I must get my son to succeed me. I don't believe in all these professional managers. Get them to do the work that you instruct them to do. I found that a bit offensive, personally. But I decided not to show my offense. But I said, I beg to differ with you, sir. It's not your company. He said, nobody's ever told me this before. I said, I'm telling you, you own 46% of the equity. Even if you own 66%, it's not yours. The moment you're less than 100, somebody else has got a stake in that. And even if you're 100, the community has a stake in it. You can't do whatever you feel like. Anyway, we had a point of contention and the debate went on. But this is what I mean by Niti. So chairman will walk into a room saying, I am the chairman, I am the last word on it, rather than I am the chief listener in this room, have a different effect on the board than chairman who walk in saying, I'll let everybody prattle and then I'll take the decision. And you have both types of chairman. Right. So Gopal, just a quick response from you on uh, this promoter-driven companies because a uh, substantial part of the book details the corporate failures in India, Kingfisher or CG Power, Satyam, and all of them are promoter-driven companies. So any specific comment from you as to what is the debilitating factor in promoter-driven companies? No, I would not, I hope I have not 
suggested that promoter driven companies have a inbuilt debility and that is not my intention if inadvertently it's come that way i clarify every company has a founder like every human being has a parent <laughs> right i don't mind the use of the word founder i don't mind the use of the word majority shareholder but this word promoter you know language india is a linguistic culture you know you think of egypt you think of pharaohs and pyramids you think of uh, greeks you think of pillars and uh, plato and aristotle india is a linguistic culture in this room i can bet my bottom dollar everybody here in this room will be speaking at least two languages if not three it may not be perfect but hindi some kannada some tamil and then english everybody would be speaking so we are a linguistic culture and therefore the word makes a big difference and my problem with this is given that we are a linguistic culture the idea that we should call it a promoter driven gives the impression that somehow he is the guy who matters i have known promoters who sorry i'm using the word because it's in common use who say why do i need independent directors and therefore that's the sort of uh, thrust in which i i don't think there's something wrong with promoter driven companies is people who think that they have exercise full power without accountability to any other person that's the problem it may be a promoter it could happen in a professional company you know it could happen in tata or hindustan lever or icici or whatever uh gopal a substantial part of the book looks at the uh components of corporate governance such as the board of directors the ceo the independent directors and so on so let's take one each one of them quickly so that our friends here will get a perspective on what is it that you're trying to convey there speaking of the board of directors what you have said is that boards do not usually reckon the behavioral aspects they ignore what you describe as the smoke signals and one very unusual word that you have brought out prodome which are early signs of governance failure would you like to comment on that well i alluded to that in my opening remarks we would devise the question eh? because i do believe that a director howsoever innocent he may be of the nature of the business of that company or the people around can see or feel that something is not right and i think i call them early warning signals prodrome is a word we borrowed from medical terminology a doctor says these are the early signals of diabetes or cancer or whatever so i've just borrowed that term and i've given this 15 point question eh and i can bet you your bottom dollar i'm not promoting the sale of my book actually i am <laughs> but do buy the book and see that 15 point question eh and apply it to india as you see it today apply it to israel apply it to china and see whether it works and then apply it to building society just to quote uh, what gopal has written folks on page 11 he says the invisible behavioral aspects of corporate governance inadequate listening skills disagreements meaningful participation in strategy or succession planning interpretation of smoke signals behavioral oddities and trust building these merit significant attention and then he goes on to add that in respect of why board members don't do it he says the benefit of being accepted is far greater than the benefit of being right or cautious hence behavior often trumps the rules and laws that define the role and duties of the independent director the board chairman and the myriad do's and don'ts for them i thought that was a very eloquent and strong way of putting it now gopal uh, coming to uh, more discussion on this board of directors there is a very elaborate mention made about the biases that prevail among the boards which lead to deficiencies in the governance structure such as you know cognitive bias group think and so on will you elaborate on that well again i alluded to that in my opening remarks so i will not spend too much time on it maybe it will be helpful if i took a specific example so that it doesn't sound like uh, 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 something theoretical 
uh, there was a board meeting of Tata Sons. I don't mind saying this because this happened 25 years ago, and the people concerned are still alive. So I'm not talking behind their back. And a subject came up that Tata Sons, which is the company of which I was the director, had a certain amount of land, uh, not land, uh, building space uh, in a very prime location. Those of you who are familiar with Bombay know Kala Goda is not exactly back of the beyond. And that it would be given to Trent, which is promoted by Simon and uh, Noel Tata, to set up a departmental store. So this goes back 20-25 years. I was a new guy of the block, and I was in a dilemma. What was going through my head is, uh, yeah, we got a piece of uh, real estate which we don't need. We must give it to somebody. But <laughs> he is your brother. and she is related to you and how do i know that you are getting the right rupees per square foot but how do i say it person sitting in the chair is ratan tata and the people sitting around the table if you sat on a tata sons board it is a good lesson in humility you know nani palki wala jamshed baba you know the very illustrious bunch of guys and you are the little pip squeak at the corner but to my great help Ratan Tata himself said that this is, in those days the word related party transaction hadn't been invented. <laughs> He said it would not be appropriate for the board to consider this proposal. He himself has moved the proposal because I don't have any access to competitive courts. How do I know I'm getting the right price? So I, I mean, I said whatever my biases, I'm just saved from ignominy. I would have got kicked out of the board if I. I thought I would have got kicked out of the board. so i don't think i would have got kicked out and the whole matter was deferred and 3 months later they came with all the stuff and i think it was changed from x to x plus something else and it's an arms length transaction later on rtps and all came in and i'm giving that as an example to say how the bias works i'm not giving that as an example of how i broke the bias because this is not about me it's about the board dynamics So uh one part of governance has to do with the CEO because the CEO sets the mood and the functioning of the board in many respects and generally the CEO is identified as a heroic figure the person who stands at the deck and is able to take the whole thing forward and you rightly say in your book that the CEO himself should be or herself should be a, an amalgam of achara and vichara that is conduct and intent in addition to competence of course you have also given details about the mantras for ceos uh would you like to sp- spell them out a little bit because they are i think relevant for this discussion on what we expect from ceos and how their role is in order to prevent uh, corporate failure uh, governance failure and promote good positive governance I won't go into it in any uh, big detail uh, and refer to the book and item number one, two, three, four. Um, but I have tried to reflect. See, I began my career a long time ago, 55 years ago, and in my early years, and those who are in my sort of age group will relate to this very well. The image of a good CEO. CEO is a surrogate for promoter, chairman, whatever you want to call him. You know, don't take CEO. Uh, other than to say a powerful person in a powerful position uh had to have big blue eyes a square jaw uh, he had to be able to bark out orders he had to have a clarity of mind which is sharper than the shaving razor he used in the morning and uh, he knew the answer to everything and all you had to do was to ask him and he would tell you that was the image harold janine he was a master of wisdom later on poor jack welch when he was alive he was a hero then he became a zero but let's not get into that gradually during my 55 years i have found the image of a ceo has changed thanks to um, people like r r nair who is in this audience who brought in the soft touch to leadership and today the narrative if the ceo admits he doesn't know more than other people the ceo listens more than he talks 
the ceo reaches out to people here the ceo comes with an open mind which means he doesn't come with the idea that this is the way to fix this problem he says i wonder how to fix this problem then his mind is open and if you come in saying i was just discussing with some other occasion that when i read board papers i have a pen i'm sure many of you do the same thing we mark and then when the like a hockey field when the field opens up a little i'll jump in with that question <laughs> and i'll try to finish all my four but he's got a different four and so on and so forth so you don't get an accretion of wisdom i have shot my four arrows he has shot his four arrows the poor chap has survived eight arrows and you let him off the hook the way that prakash tandon was the chairman when i joined the company i was a little kid obviously but i looked up to him and one day he told me many years later he became a senior friend if i may use that word but when i was a trainee he invited us for lunch and it was a terrifying experience i had just come out of an iit i was accustomed to eating on a steel thali without washing my hands and scooping up large volumes of food and here i was on the fifth floor dining room PDR it was called private dining room the carpet was so thick that i think i sank into it and there were three or four pieces of cutlery on each side and when we started talking there were four of us trainees at some stage prakash tandon leaned over he said young man how many years do you have said, two years and how many mouths do you have one what's the surface area of your ears compared to your mouth did some quick algorithms without software two multiplied by twice the surface area four times he said don't you think you should listen four times as much as you speak <laughs> i think it was a wonderful message and i was all of 22 at that time i felt very embarrassed but later on i thought the old man was not wrong <laughs>